unseen world of the Bible. Section 13, the great reversa. I have some objections. Uh, first, I hope that we will be able to explain how God is bringing back the Gentile nations to himself, having disinherited them after the Babel incident. Secondly, I hope that we can identify nine New Testament ruling spirits, those powers that Paul especially talks about. Thirdly, to affirm the original apostolic good news. The gospel has actually revealed in the New Testament. And fourthly, to start putting into practice 21 biblical actions that grow churches, new ones as well as old ones. All right, the lesson theme for what happened at Pentecost was a battle plan for infiltrating all the nations disinherited by God in Babel with the gospel of Jesus, an ancient strategy for spiritual war. Chapter 2 takes us back to the Feast of Pentecost in apparently 33 CE. When the day of Pentecost came, we were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. That house was probably a room in the temple complex, which is where they were meeting regularly. But what does this great wind sound and these flames of fire, what would that have meant to a Bible-reading Jew in the first century CE? The God was present. On the Old Testament, there were several. I said, that's how God appeared. You know, the fire, clouds, or, or wind. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All right. If this was a reversal of something that had happened earlier, what was it that had happened for which there would be a return of God to the temple and the speaking in other languages? Well, Bob pointed out that winds and flames and fire indicated the presence of Yahweh. Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Yahweh spoke to Job out of the storm. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze, depicting the throne of God in the heavens as fire. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in flames of fire. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants suggesting that these may have been angelic manifestations surrounding the presence of Yahweh. And the book of Hebrews, then quoting that same psalm, he makes his angel spirits and his servants flames of fire. So the great reversal then takes us back to Genesis chapter 11. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. Any idea how literal that is? Yeah, as far as he scattered, I mean, I assume the people walked off in different directions. I mean, the Isn't it interesting that in just the last four to five years, and in fact, last four to five months, archaeologists and aerial mappers have discovered new civilizations that existed unknown to us until recently. And there are, even on Netflix, you shouldn't go there, but there's <laughs> exposés on uh, the pyramids that are being discovered and uncovered. And a lot of speculation now about how far the humans had spread around the world. And it appears that every inhabitable part of the globe has had human communities, some apparently before the flood and many afterwards. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, corresponding to this scattering, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation. Each one heard their own language being spoken. So God had begun a process of multiplying languages, 
scattering of the peoples. And now on the day of Pentecost, we have Jewish believers, faithful Jews, and Gentile converts to Judaism who have come to Jerusalem and they experience this arrival of Yahweh back into the temple. They hear the greatness of God being proclaimed in their own languages, apparently by ordinary folk who had never learned those languages. The apostles and perhaps others were speaking in tongues, to use the literal translation. Were those real human languages, or was that some kind of ecstatic emotionalism? Real. How do we know? Because they heard them in a language that they understood. It's not a miracle of hearing, it's a miracle of speaking. And what was the result of this? They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And of course we know the reply. They should repent, put their faith in the Lord Jesus <coughs> Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and receive the Holy Spirit. Jews from every nation. They were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together and moved over them, because each one heard their own language. Right. God is now directing his spirit into the new community in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, commissioning them to speak the truth of the gospel to Jews who in turn now would go home to their uh, cities of origin where they had synagogues where Gentiles were being converted to Judaism in order to speak the basics of what they had learned at Jerusalem. And Paul and others would follow up and visit those cities to help the believing Jews uh, establish themselves in the gospel and where necessary to start new synagogues or new churches as we would say with Gentile believers as well. Now this recalls a number of Old Testament passages such as Ezekiel 36. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you to your own land. Well that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. There will be a further fulfillment of that but uh, it had begun. And I will put my spirit within you, then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am Yahweh. I am returning to the nations and reclaiming them for myself. To do this, they had to preach the good news. Now, you and I have heard numerous gospel presentations over the years. There's a thousand ways to tell the gospel. And uh, most of us got saved on just a little piece of the gospel, just a few string of truth, but it was enough. I'm going to suggest here that the original apostolic good news is revealed very clearly in the New Testament in the 10 or 12 times where the gospel message is actually reproduced in short form, of course, and in an attempt to understand the content of the gospel, the truth that was actually spoken, I've looked at all those passages and come up with a few things that were part of their message. At least amongst the Jews, the fact that God has fulfilled that which his prophets foretold. Secondly, Jesus is the promised Messiah, and as such, he is our Lord. Thirdly, the same Jesus went about doing good and healing, especially delivering those who were under the oppression of the devil. This is something we often forget to mention. Fourthly, that lawless men conspired to have Jesus crucified. We'll often say Jesus died for your sins, but we often forget to tell how that came about. <clears throat> Unless we can get folk into a Bible study or have them read the Gospels. Fifthly, God has raised his servant Jesus back to life. Why was he called servant so often? Because he fulfilled the Isaiah predictions. Sixthly, God has exalted Jesus into heaven as Savior and Lord. In the Old Testament, who was the Savior? Yahweh said, I am the Savior, there is no other. 
And so when we began calling Jesus Savior, we were identifying him with Yahweh. And seventhly, Jesus' apostles are eye and ear witnesses. We haven't made this stuff up. Pastor mentioned his message this morning. Simon identified himself as an apostle. He was saying, I was there. I saw it. I heard it. I interacted with him. You can take my word for it. But the apostles had more to say. God gives his Holy Spirit to those who believe this message. And this is something we can do. We can, we can make it part of our gospel presentation. Yes, you will change. And you will change from the inside. Jesus Christ or his Holy Spirit will come dwell in you. Meanwhile, we are waiting for Jesus to return from heaven to earth. Jesus will raise to life those who trust in him. Just as he came back to life physically, you and I too will one day live again physically in a new body. Thank God. Mm -hmm. God forgives the sins of all who repent. If repent is meaningless, you have to use another term. Turn to Jesus, and God will forgive you everything. God has appointed Jesus as everyone's judge. And this message is for both Jews and Gentiles. Oh, by the way, Jesus ordered us to tell this message everywhere. That's why you get so tired of us Christians getting in your face about Jesus. Now, these Gentiles, meanwhile, which includes most of us, they were under the authority of other gods. By way of review, let's look at some verses that we've seen here too. By the way, Dr. Heiser, in his last possible last message on earth, he said it was these two passages we're going to look at that transformed his understanding of the Hebrew Bible. When you look up to the sky and see all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them or wor and worshiping them in the, uh, the things the Lord your God has appointed to all the nations under heaven. So when God apportioned land to all of the various people groups as they were migrating, he also gave them spirit guidance. The Israelites, however, they were never to bow down to those, those Gentile spirit guides. Yes. Well, as I was reading that, Gentiles under the authority of other gods. Right. And we know that, okay, they had uh, Dagon and the fish god, and they had Asherah and a whole series of those. But that's not the ones that God is part of the team. They're just the symbols of the other gods. Is that correct? Uh, let's say right now, yes, that's correct. But we could refine what you said a bit. Okay. The gods who were put in charge of the various nations, they did not stay faithful to the task. So Psalm 82, for example, excoriates these gods because they failed to guide the Gentiles into living righteously. In fact, they were unable to. So these were not the fallen angels. These were somebody on the team who just decided to do his own thing. That was one, Satan, he, he fell. Or oh, John. <laughs> when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So we're just reminding ourselves now what has happened after the, the Babel incident, which is being reversed now through the preaching of the gospel. Now, it's not just the Hebrews or the Bible that had this idea that nations were directed by special deities and spirits. The pagans themselves recognized this. Both Greek and Latin philosophers talked about it. So, for example, Plato wrote, Each city has its own guardian spirit, and the god who presides over each people group is the one who is most interested in them. If the Gentiles could figure out who their God was, they'd pray to him. In the case of Athens, you remember, from Acts chapter 17, they weren't too sure which God was punishing them with disease. And so they had put up an altar to which God? Unknown. Yeah. Unknown God. So then Xenophon wrote, 
the God who presides over the city is the one who has the greatest concern for it. In other words, let's say, let's, let's respect these gods. Perhaps they won't be so harsh with us. We may even get some help from them. Then Aristotle wrote, as for the gods, the belief in their existence has been implanted in mankind for many reasons, the chief of which is the fact that all things are governed by them. Did he get it right? Well, in some way, yeah. These spirits that have deviated from the law of God, they do advise national leaders. They have ways of speaking, especially through their philosophers. The national leaders personally consulted without even realizing it. Exactly. And of course, this week, what's going on in Davos, Switzerland? A meeting of industrial, educational, and political leaders from all around the world where they are hearing from the gods, laying their plans for your and my future. And Cicero, more recently, all nations have believed that there are gods and they have had some understanding of their nature and powers, although it is not the same in every nation. Through the gospel, this entire system is being reversed as God is bringing people group after people through the gospel back to himself. Now, Paul, in his epistles, he talked about at least nine classes of spirit beings. There are the arche, just means something like ruler or top dog. Archon, which is kind of a verbal, nominal verbal form for the same thing, or a ruling one. They're called dunamis because they have a power. They have power, they are able to do things. They can actually perform what you and I would consider false miracles. Some are called exousia, that is, they have authority. They have God-granted authority to dictate to the groups in whom they have been put in charge, although they're doing it poorly. Some of them are called theos, God. So the same word that the Bible uses for the true God is used for the lesser gods. These are the national deities. I have been in countries where they've shown me the shrines of the national deity. Some are called, I like this word, cosmocrats. <laughs> That's like a political party. The world sovereigns of some kind. Then curios, they are lords, they are owners. The same term that is used in the New Testament for the Lord Jesus Christ is also used for these spirit lords who lord it over the Gentiles. An abstract uh, related word, lordship. And then they're sometimes called pneumatikoi, meaning pure spirit beings. They are spiritual in nature. But then he describes these several terms that Paul uses to remind us. First, he said they are many. There's not just one God, there are many. But they are unseen. So the idol is only a representation, a kind of dwelling that the idolaters create, make it pretty, keep it clean, give it food, so that the God will come dwell in the idol. And they get tired sometimes, so you have to ring a bell to wake them up. <laughs> They're pernicious, that is, they are actively and intentionally evil, but only of this age. In the age to come, they will be themselves disinherited, disempowered. They operate primarily <coughs> in the realm of darkness. However, where are they? They are in heaven, that is, from the ground going up. One verse says that they are the powers of the air, Sometimes you would say they're in the heavens. Now, for the reversal to take place, there's something else going on in the book of Acts. But after the Babel incident, when God divided up the peoples, put them in charge of the so-called sons of God, these spirit beings, they began to spread out through the earth. And the particular places that are mentioned in scripture, in Genesis chapter 10, 
can be more or less located within what today you and I might call the Middle East. And stretching from possibly Tarshish on your far left all the way over to the right. If you count them up, they're either 70 or 72, depending on how you divide the words in Hebrew. Reason for which the New Testament documents that talk about Jesus sending out 70, some of the ancient documents say he sent out 72. So somebody was correcting their New Testament to match their reading of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Unless it went the other way. All right, now then, when you go through the book of Acts, and fortunately there are those who have time on their hands and have done this, locate every place that is mentioned by name in the book of Acts, and you spread them on the map, it's the same terrain. So in effect, the New Testament is saying the gospel of Jesus Christ is now going to all the nations that were disinherited as the great reversal. <laughs> and one of the Jews gathered there at Pentecost said, well, we have Jews here from every nation under heaven. Consider that phrase for a moment. Nations under heaven. What does that sound like in English? The world. The world, every place on earth. But if you think biblically, the phrase itself, under heaven, possibly imply what? Every place where these spirits dwell in charge of humans. Anyway, that's reading perhaps too much into the text. So now, how to bring the nations back under Yahweh's authority? Remember what he said to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Chapter 10, Babel, the spreading of the people across the earth. Chapter 11, you have the descendants described. <laughs> anyway, when we get to chapter 12, God now calls Abraham and he creates a new people who will come to be called Israel, who do not figure in the list of nations in Genesis 10. In Deuteronomy, he said, I gave the nations into the charge of the spirits, but Israel I kept for myself. Because Israel's task is eventually to bring the nations back to himself. And so at the conclusion of his work on earth, what did the Lord Jesus Christ tell his apostles to do? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So, if the lesser gods had authority over the nations, what is Jesus now proclaiming? It's not merely in heaven, but also on earth. Yeah. So he said, all that authority that was distributed to the spirits, I now possess it. They no longer have that authority. They can only work by deceit at the present time. What were the apostles to do? And most of us accept that we have some role in fulfilling the apostolic commission of make disciples. What does a disciple do? All this. Linguistically, you might say follow, but according to the text, the words of Jesus, what do disciples do? Pass it on. Yes. Teach. They teach. What do they teach? They teach. Gospel. What gospel. Look at the verse. To obey what Jesus commanded them. Oh, that sounds like works. <laughs> Aren't we saved by grace through faith alone? Yes, we are. <laughs> saved. What do we do? We live joyfully and lovingly obeying the commandments that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us. Love, obey my commandments. Exactly. So, what we'd like to do now, come back to chapter 2 of the Acts, to suggest that that chapter itself not only reveals the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but also gives us a basic strategy with tactics for planting and growing churches out amongst all of the nations as well as in our own cities. 
And my promise to you is that any congregation who begins implementing the commands of Jesus as we see them described in Acts chapter 2 will see numeric growth, both quality and quantity. So, what do we read at the end of the chapter? Or add to the numbers daily those who were being saved. Right. Now, if you want to grow a church, I recommend that you primarily grow it through new believers. Because the old believers bring with them their bad theology, their bad habits, their bad attitudes, and their false expectations of what the traditions are. Well, let's see what, uh, what we've come up with so far in so brief a moment. Uh, this would be worthy of an entire course. All right, uh, so group A. Your verses, 37 to 41, contains exactly seven action verbs, and they all relate to evangelism. So what were they? Heard. Heard, okay. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, well, we added pierce and cut, but that's not necessarily dealing with evangelism. Repent. Mm -hmm. Baptize. Yep. Uh, forgive. Forgiveness is a good word. Mm -hmm. uh, receive. Yep. Witness. Uh, we put down warned. Mm -hmm. so those are the ones that I heard. Okay, those were I. Right. And did you come up with any commands of Jesus that lie behind those actions? We didn't get that far. We didn't get that far. No. Okay. Let's see if I got the same ones. Here, all right, Matthew 11, Jesus said, let them hear, repent. Je First thing that Jesus ever taught publicly was repent and believe the good news. Baptize. That's what Jesus told us to do. If you want to help new believers stay faithful to Jesus, baptize them sooner. Don't find reasons not to do so. They become discouraged and go away. Forgive. Jesus commanded, go, whosoever sins you declare to be forgiven, they are forgiven. Receive the Holy Spirit. It's not only promised, it's commanded. And bear witness, Jesus had said, Acts 8, you will be my witnesses. And seventhly, remember my word. If you are faithful to my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Second group, group B, you have seven action verbs all dealing with disciple making. Teaching. Yeah. Fellowshipping. Right. Breaking of bread. Yeah. yeah. Prayer. Prayer. Something about miracles that we didn't. Yeah, okay. That's about as far as we got. About being awestruck okay. not by by the confirmation of the power by the demonstration of the apostles and signs Amen. and wonders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sense yeah. of awe. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, there's a command of Jesus behind every one of those. He did say, "Abide in my word." Go teach. Primarily, teach his commandments. Then love one another. He has said, and that's what they were doing in their midst through their fellowship and giving to each other. He did say, remember my death. So they were breaking bread together. And he said, oh, by the way, pray using my name. Awe or fear, some of the translations say, came upon everyone. He had said, fear God. And he commanded to go heal the sick. A little hard for Westerners to comprehend that one. But if you were a, an evangelistic team in India, that would be one of your primary methods of evangelism. Praying for the sick. And if they get healed, preach the gospel to them. If they don't, it's not their time. All right, let's go on then. A third set of actions relating to body life. Selling. Distributing. Distributing, yes. Get into the temple. Break bread. Mm-hmm. Worship and praise God. Any commands of Jesus behind those? If you do all that, you will be added. It will be added to your kingdom. We just sell everything. We'll have a bigger church. <laughs> Believe in me, Jesus had said. I'll be faith. He said, gather in my name, Acts Matthew 18. Sell and give. If you have the opportunity and the need is there. Uh, and then give freely. And he also said, uh, go enter into houses. And they were meeting in each other's homes, as well as occasionally at the temple. And rejoice and be glad. They were worshiping the Lord with gladness of heart. 
and then to show love for God and for others. So our duty then, I take it as Christians, is to help each other find ways to obey the commands of Jesus, expecting that the Lord will recognize that he can entrust to us new believers because we will rear them. I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. I would go to Spain. Most historians recognize that Spain is the Greek name for the Hebrew land called Tarshish, which was the westernmost tip of the known world at that time. Now, was the world any bigger than what the Bible recognizes? 